This is part two of Warcraft 1 Geography, covering the human campaign. I recommend watching part one that covers the ore campaign first if you haven't already, due to continuity. Otherwise, let's dive right in. As a test of your abilities, the king has appointed you as regent over a small parcel of land. Since we must keep our armies in the field well supplied, you are to build the town into a farming center of no less than six farms. Construction of a barracks for defense is also advised, as our scouts have reported orc patrols in the area. Following similar beats to the Orc campaign, a lot of missions share a close resemblance. Swiftly learning the game's economy system and early unit structure, you'll be crafting war before long. Unlike the Orc campaign, however, this particular mission lacks any specific details about the location apart from the low-poly 3D model of the map. Considering the farm-heavy nature though, and the maps being so far west, it's not a stretch to think that this could be Westfall. Orcs are few, and may simply be scouting parties sent from the east regions where they're more heavily entrenched. Several mines dotted around the map also help reinforce this location. Obviously, gold mines are a necessary game element for most missions, but the geography that orcs and humans cover does contain several caverns and mine shafts in World of Warcraft, often aligning closely to the same locations. Flexibility and imagination is crucial to exploring these comparisons, as the original game is bare bones when compared to the expansive landscape of the MMO. Not surprising how much difference literally exactly 10 years can make. Even these children of the underworld are no match for Azor and Steel. The orcs around Grand Hamlet are becoming increasingly brazen in their attacks, and our spies inform us that they are amassing a large army to march against the town. The king is sending you, along with a small detachment of troops, to rally the people and defend the town against all opposition. This mission, again, follows closely to the one prior. A brief tutorial introduction to combat and combat units. A large orcish army mentioned in the prologue is noticeably absent from this map. A few small skirmishes against grunts and spearmen play out and the mission draws to a close. A fair test for a second mission. You can't be expected to brave high tier warfare as a simple captain. This map differs from the orc campaign, primarily the changes to the bridges and roads. While we speculated in the previous video that these bridges are the northeastern corner of Duskwood, the layout here is altered and the bridge is missing. We could interpret these to be different bridges, thus loosely lining up with the bridges in Deadwind Pass. A bit of a stretch given that in Deadwind, they are essentially large rocks used to cross chasms, but you know, it's not impossible. Canonically, the Grand Hamlet is destroyed, making the demo of this level follow closer to the lore, as it is completely overrun in seconds, and you are utterly helpless without the full version. There's a rather humorous jab at the player, that the kingdom's economy is bled dry by the war, and your contributions are required to fund the armies. You better get out and buy it before this is all your fault. Yes. Even these children of the underworld are no match for Azeroth's steel. With Black Hand's raiding parties routed, now is the time for us to secure a lasting peace in the area around Grand Hamlet. You must seek out the orcish outpost of Kairos that lies deep within the swamps of sorrow and destroy it. The first glimpse into the dark magic that the orcs possess. The Necrolites raise the dead, friend or foe, frightful warriors of bone, fearless in the face of your men. But they should fear not. The clerics of North Shrabri now aid your battles, tending to the wounds of your ranks, be they physical or mental. As it is written in the game's manual, clerical healing does not simply absolve grief and pain, but rather splits it across all humankind, making the burden far less to bear. Another key difference between the orcs and humans, well illustrated between these two units. The valiant brothers in arms, fighting for the good of one another, as much as their kingdom, and the orcish whirlwind of destruction, using any means to press onward into glorious bloodshed. It's easy to lay the destruction of the Grand Hamlet and the humans' tenacity in their pursuit. The orcs are seen as the bloodthirsty ones, seeking to ravage the land in pursuit of violence to quench them. But in the region's desire for vengeance, he overextended his forces, stretching the heads out too far, allowing the greenskins to swiftly sink their axes into the neck of the Grand Hamlet. The raiding parties are forced back and Kyros is destroyed, but at a cost. 
Even these children of the underworld are no match for Azeroth Steel. It has been some 20 months since Sir Lothar, one of the Crown's greatest heroes, led an expedition into the Dead Mines to search for the lost Tome of Divinity. They were never heard from again. However, the Great Knight has recently appeared to the Abbot of Northshire in a vision, battered and pleading for assistance. King Lane has ordered you to lead a detachment of warriors and healers into the mines in an attempt to find Sir Lothar, heal him, and bring him and any other survivors back alive. Lothar is a hefty name in the terms of Warcraft lore. The Lion of Azeroth himself was already in his early 50s during the First War, having lived a full, rich life. From adventuring at a young age with Medivh and Prince Lane to joining the Stormen military, being placed among the King's Honor Guard, he would eventually be knighted, becoming an armsman of the Brotherhood of the Horse, the Alliance's mounted division, which is about the most anime thing I've seen in early Warcraft. <laughs> These skills would serve him well throughout the years, braving life and limb in the service of the crown, prevailing in the most dire of circumstances. Even the greatest of heroes can require aid from time to time, and Lothar is no exception. The regent is charged with his rescue and extensive imprisonment of how long was it? 20, 20 months. That's... That's a really, really long time to be in prison by ogres. <laughs> Clerics are dispatched alongside your soldiers fighting bravely in an effort to close the wounds of Stormwind's champion and recover the artifact he sought. The Tomb of Divinity is of great value to the clerics of North Shire Abbey, containing holy texts inciting the reader to practice the arts of delight, not only to smite evil, but to inspire all men through compassion and bravery. Until the Cataclysm, The Destroyer, the end of all things. The tome was a part of the Paladin quest chain to learn the redemption spell. Yes. A future video will go through these class quests in greater yes. depth, so subscribe yes. if you're interested in seeing that, and let me know in the comments yes. if there's other topics you'd want to see covered at length. Cheers of victory come from the troops as the last orcish horse crumbles to the ground. The forest of Elwyn is a strategic key to securing the borderlands. An outpost near the southeast edge of the forest will serve as your stronghold. The king has assigned one of his knights to aid you, so that your task of ridding the area of Blackhand's dark minions may be more readily completed. Mission 5. The Forest of Elwyn. Taking place directly east of the Deadmines, the Forest of Elwyn is described as being very close to the Borderlands, and with the original map location being here, we can safely say that this is part of the Deadwind Pass prior to its corruption. Outside of the addition of mounted cavalry, this mission mostly consists of a skirmish amongst the trees and an assault on York camp. Fairly straightforward, but it may have been more appropriate location-wise if it took place later in the campaign, particularly right before you progress into the Swamp of Sorrows and the Black Morass. Not entirely implausible, as the goal is to dismantle an outpost in the area, and war can be unpredictable. Though knowing areas so well, and North Shore Abbey preceding this mission, it feels like a small hindrance in the momentum. Cheers of victory come from the troops as the last orcish corpse crumbles to the ground. The monks of North Shore Abbey are under siege by a band of warriors that have been convinced by enemy agents to fight against the crown. You will be given a complement of knights to lead to the Abbey, which is already under attack. Ride hard and fast, as you must prevent its destruction. When you have secured the Abbey and beaten back these treacherous curs, you must then move to destroy the enemy at their source. The only human v human mission pertaining to the holy site of the clerics. Taking place prior to the Orc mission, in the same location, you are tasked with defending the Abbey from a rebellion spurred on by an unknown force. Swiftly, you quash those that have betrayed the crown and apparently bury any sign of their existence, as this whole event is fairly absent from most of the lore, while the defense being entirely in vain, as we know the Orcs would sweep through in a destructive wave to rescue Garona, it would explain as to why any notes that there was a rebellion to begin with would be missing. There might be some overlap between the humans that rebel against the crown and the brigands that occupy the Abbey in the Orc mission. The forces of darkness have
have been soundly defeated. A raiding party has completely overrun the village of Sunnyglade. Our scouts report that the survivors have been taken to a hidden orcish compound to serve as slaves. You must take a detachment of warriors and rescue the group of peasants that are imprisoned somewhere in the orc camp. Our intelligence confirms that all of the prisoners are together and that you must destroy the enclosure to open a path for their escape. The rebuilding of Sunnyglade is also of the utmost importance as you will need their assistance in destroying the orcish slaves. As we established in the first video under the Orc mission by the same name, Sunnyglade is almost certainly located near the Tower of Azor, which remained intact during the Orcish, very polite, non-hostile takeover, JK, JK, this is war, bing bang boom. However, now you're charged with rescuing, reclaiming, and rebuilding all in one mission. Again, the compassion of the kingdom is on full display here, risking the lives of the many for the few. Seven peasants may not seem like a lot, but it's more than four. Personally, I tend to imagine that a single unit in Warcraft, in most games, in most situations, is often just a representation of a far greater number of that same type of unit. A single grunt could represent a whole squad. One peasant might include a team of craftspeople, builders, and an architect. Or alternatively, a whole bunch of really pissed off miners. In terms of scale, the maps we see in the RTS title and in World of Warcraft are simple and scaled down to make them more digestible and more enjoyable areas of play. If you need more inspiration, just look at the movie. The locations are massive, and really just the beginning of the true size. Yes, my lord. Yes, yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. Yes, my lord. Yes. The forces of darkness have been soundly defeated. A new crisis has arisen that threatens to end the lives of all who would serve the king. The evil warlock Medivh has begun draining the soul of the land itself to increase his dark powers. You must take a party into his tower and destroy him before he summons enough energies to devastate all who would oppose him. Beware his mastery of the black arts, for legend speaks of his ability to command the demons of hell. To spite a war raging on their doorstep, a malignant power grows. Although not quite yes. simply, the evil warlock, as described in the intro monologue, Medivh was integral to the orcs' arrival on Azeroth to begin with. Prior to the invasion, the Dark Titan and intergalactic supervillain Sargeras had invested the mind and body of Medivh, using the evil warlock as a puppet on Azeroth while simultaneously manipulating the orcish clans on their homeworld of Draenor. With the orcs rallied and Mostly, unified across the Cosmic Sea, the Orcish Warlocks and Medivh tore open a rift between their respective worlds, housed on either end by a dark portal. After Medivh's seeming betrayal of the humans came to light, Anduin Lothar would lead a party to Karazhan and slay Medivh. Lothar and Medivh, however, were more than just passing combatants. Both grew up together in the Kingdom of Stormwind, alongside the then Prince Glain Rin. They shared in adventures and became close friends. Medivh would soon fall into a coma at the age of 14, again due to the soul-corrupting Megachad Sargeras. During this time, Lothar and the clerics of Northshire would tend to him as best they could until he awoke a decade later, his mind now under the total control of Sargeras. Assuming the guise of Medivh, proceeding with the opening of the Dark Portal and forever changing the world, Lothar with his men at his back cut down Medivh, and with his death, the demon infestation and spirit would leave his body. But this is not the last we'll see of either. The time has come to take the battle into Blackhand's own domain. King Lane has ordered a full assault upon the Orcs, demanding that this plague that spreads across the kingdom be eradicated. To the east of the borderlands lies the Black Morass, where the Orcish hordes make their encampments. You are to lead an army into this foul region and destroy every trace of their dark presence. Retcons aside, the Black Morass has seen the biggest physical change to its landscape. The Great Marsh that once was has succumbed to the power of the Dark Portal, twisted by its presence. The Orcs and Humans Manual describes it thusly. 
More and more warriors were brought through the rift, and with them seemed to come the essence of our world. The warlocks claimed into some effect of the portal, but the lands about our entryway soon became as desolate as those of our home. Years later, as more portals were opened on Draenor in an effort to reach other distant worlds, the planet itself became unstable and subsequently exploded, becoming Outland as we know it now. This event would be felt on Azeroth as well, accelerating the destruction of the fauna and flora of the Black Morass into the blasted lands. Water, gone. Tree, dead. Boars, hell boars. The mission map has quite a few gold mines sprinkled throughout, and WoW's map also has several similar caverns. It's especially difficult to draw comparisons between these maps, as the terrain itself has changed so much, making these the only real landmarks. It seems odd that the Dark Portal does not appear in game, though given the way the story came about, it seems secondary, almost an afterthought to the game itself. This would change drastically in Warcraft 2, Tides of Darkness, which we'll be covering in future video. Victory come from the troops as the last orcish corpse crumbles to the ground. Runners have arrived and informed you of grave news. King Lane lies dead this day, assassinated by the treacherous Corona at Stormwind Keep. His last command was that you should assume the mantle of war leader and end this battle that has drained the land of its resources and now its king. Scouts report that deep within the Black Morass lies one of Black Hand's darkest seats of power, the Temple of the Damned. No peasants dare approach the vile temple, and only the bravest of your soldiers have agreed to accompany you on this mission. You must strike boldly and without air, for there will be no reinforcements. While the Temple of the Damned appears in Warcraft 2 as a Death Knight frat house and Warcraft 3 as an undead retirement village, in Orcs and Humans it's an entire sprawling settlement made up of multiple temples to train necrolites. The manual states that they contain immense sacrificial altars, but the need for blood offerings have recently been replaced by one of gold, which sounds like an absolute cash grab to me. This mission also marks the point in the game where continuity between the two campaigns starts to erode and story elements begin to break down. King Lane is assassinated by Garona, but is also killed by Ogrim Doomhammer. Blackhand is killed by both the Orcs and the humans separately in their respective campaigns, and at the end of the human campaign, you enjoy victory over the Orcs in Stormwind, which has already been destroyed. Obviously, this is an oversight in writing, but you could easily see this as an alternate timeline. Time space shenanigans by the bronze dragonflight, or the dying dreams of King Lane as he bleeds to death in the burning storm wind, and it's a little dark. Even these children of the underworld are no match for Azeroth steel. Here beats the diseased and malevolent heart of Blackhand's plagued lands. The sister towns of Rockard and Stoneard are all that stand between the forces of the kingdom and Blackhand's stronghold, Blackrock Spire. After conferring with your war chiefs, the path to victory lays clear. You must destroy Rockard and Stoneard, thereby cutting off all lines of support and supplies, so that the final offensive can be made upon Blackrock Spire. Another mission taking place in the muddled lands of the Black Morass and the Swamp of Sorrows. Stone, though destroyed in this mission, would be repaired or rebuilt before WoW takes place and Rockhot is currently controlled by the Stonewall Ogres that reside there. As is the gold standard by Oxen Humans, there's zero indication of which of these towns is which, so it's time to do the classic Analyze the Roads and the Gold Mines. <laughs> Kiss. Screw it. This is Stoneard because I I like it more and fuck you. That's that, that's canon and I'm the king of Blizzard now. The forces of darkness have been soundly defeated. Black Rock Spire stands before us. The skies above the reeking swamp fill with the gathering thunderheads that spell doom for the loser in this final confrontation. 
tension hangs like a heavy cloak on your shoulders as your troops prepare for the battle ahead. Above the din and chaos that swirls about the battlefield stands the castle of Blackhand, its gaze sweeping down upon the battlefield where the destiny of the land will be decided. Destroy the stronghold and those who would seek to defend it, and Azeroth will be freed from Blackhand's poisoned grip forever. Any raider or dungeoneer worth his salt knows the challenges that await those that enter Blackrock Mountain. While it's now known as the home of the insidious black dragon Nefarian at its peak, and the CEO of Fire, Ragnaros, in the depths below, the orcs were able to carve out a piece of the mountain to call their own. The Shadow Council managed a diplomatic agreement with the Dark Iron Dwarves and the lieutenants of Ragnaros, and would remain there unchecked until the end of the Second War. Oddly enough, the name Blackrock applied to both the mountain and the clan separately, both existing outside of the knowledge of the other, and the Orcish Horde simply saw it as a purely good omen to base themselves there. But where did Blackrock Mountain come from? Well, it's not a normal mountain. 200 years prior to the opening of the Dark Portal, Thrasian, the leader of the Dark Iron Dwarves, was hatching an overambitious plan to destroy the Bronzebeard and Wildhammer clans. They're dwarves too! Thrasian gathered his seven most powerful followers, who were... <clears throat> You got Angarel and Doomrel and Doprel and Gloomrel and Hatrel and see thrill by Rel. Beckoning the Fire Lord into their world, a great volcano rose and scarred the land. The eruption of which would be widespread enough to create the Burning Steps and the Searing Gorge, two literal hotbeds that are prominent locations today. The volcano would settle to become Blackrock Mountain. of Black Rock Spire spelled final victory for the forces of Azeroth. With Black Hand slain and their stronghold destroyed, the few scattered orcs that remained were quick to bow before your might. A celebration ensued that lasted for many days and nights, with music and joyous festivities resounding throughout the land. The people of the kingdom have come from miles around to gather at Stormwind Keep and are delighted by a display of mystic sights and sounds provided by the court conjurers while being treated to a feast of unequaled splendor. Amidst this celebration, your ascension to the throne is acknowledged by your new subjects, and you are given the honorarium Defender of the Crown. As the evening celebration continues into the early hours of morning, you retire to the sanctity of your throne room. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching. I've wanted to start a series in this vein for a while now, and I'm happy to be finally doing it. The next installment will be more interesting, as the locations covered by Warcraft 2 are much more varied and flesh out the rest of Azeroth significantly. While Orcs and Humans is the foundation, there is often little to be said geographically, especially when there's so many missions that pertain to the same areas. Both campaigns exist essentially as a mirror of the other, early tutorials slowly introducing additional units, a mission where you fight the same race, and then destroy the big bad base at the end. I hope you found this video enjoyable. Like and subscribe for more if you did. Be kind, and farewell.